Now the final few questions in section A focus on the model of the ratio table. In the early days of working with this I don't think any of us realised quite how powerful this model was and in fact some teachers later reported felt like the students could answer half the GCSE paper using the ratio table so although we are seeing the use of it in the context of multiplication and then division you will actually see ratio tables around throughout this series of books and it's worth doing the groundwork now to establish what these are about. But you do also have here the context a photograph and I know in a lot of English textbooks you would have this but you will see that there is a question later that does refer students back to the context. So we've got the context, we've got these and we can see them in packs of six. We then come to a mathematical representation of that context, the ratio table. But we will at a later stage be going back to the context. Again this jumping from context to mathematical model and working from one to the other is an important feature of these materials. So you've got this context set, 39 packs in stock to sell in the canteen and each pack has six bottles in it. Describe a way to estimate the answer, adjust your estimate to find an exact answer. And then here we are presented with a ratio table. Look at the picture and the table and write down three statements you know to be true about the bottles and packs. So it may feel to you you're stating the obvious here but this is important. This is working between the context and the table. So for example, if I've got 10 packs and have 60 bottles, how do you know? Well, a student might just say, because of times by six, and I think you need to push that further. What does that look like then? What does that look like in your room? What have you got here? You know, you're lifting these packs. What does that mean if you've got ten packs? How do you know there'll be sixty bottles? So just pushing them back to that idea about what multiplication is about and what it would look like. Some of them may even think about these stacked next to each other and it feels like squares on the grid possibly the previous context you know another thing they might say well in 20 there must be 120 well how do you know well that's like having the 10 packs and having them again 60 and 60 so again making the connection between repeated addition and multiplication in our experience pupils of this level are very happy with repeated addition they can see what's going on there it's not always as easy for them to see what's going on with multiplication. And again, how do you know you're right? Explain how you know each statement is true and you may do a drawing if you wish. So again, this is working on this idea of what do these 10 packs look like? What do these 60 packs look like? And again, it's worth working on this ratio table. Explain each entry and how you can work out each column from the previous one. Let's just go back there and talk about the sorts of things they might say. The students are really happy with doubling. So I think going from 10 packs to 20 packs, as I said, the re repetition of the 60 they'll be happy with. Going from 20 packs to 40 packs, I think they'll not have an issue with that. There might be things like, so I doubled the 100 and I doubled the 20, so I knew that would be 240 bottles. Going from 1 to 10 is possibly more of an issue. I think that they tend to operate in a procedure of, I've added a naught, so I've added a naught here. But I think it is worth pulling that apart. You know, what's actually going on if you've got 10 packs? What does that actually look like? Oh, right, 6 and another 6 and another 6 and another 6 and another 6. Oh, that's 30. So, again, I think you need, that, that need to explore that relationship. How have we got the 39? And it's quite likely some in the room will say, oh, well, it's like having 40 and you've taken the one off. If students had made this ratio table themselves, and they will get on to do that, it may be that they got 39 by doing 10, 20, adding those together to make 30, halving the 10 to make 5, and creeping up to 39 like that. But one of the powerful things about the ratio table is that it enables a variety of strategies to be looked at. And now we've got some practice in question 28 at using ratio tables. And again, on this worksheet you will see there is the box of lollies there for part A. There is the box of pencils there for part B. So we've got this context there if they are struggling to, to scale up from one box to ten boxes, say. We can actually visualise, imagine and talk about those boxes next to each other. 
And again, compare your solutions with your classmates and note any similarities and differences. So this is a little bit what I was talking about before. Lots of students with ratio tables, their preferred option is doubling. They're really confident with doubling, whereas you may have some students who are happy to go from 1 up to 10. So you will get a variety of methods there and it's definitely worth talking about those and sharing those and seeing the power of those. You know, you might want to do one with the class as a whole. Here's one box and it's got eight lollies. What else can you tell me? And have different students coming out to the board and filling that in. And how do you know that two boxes will have 16 in? Oh, that's interesting. You've put four boxes next. What was somebody else going to put? And so on. And here we're pushing that idea. Is there only one way to do a ratio table or are there actually several ways? This is interesting, using the ratio table for division. In the early days, quite a few of our teachers resisted this. But in fact, what's the alternative for division? Lots of students find it very difficult. And the more teachers became familiar with the ratio table, the more happy they felt with the idea of using it for division particularly because the students became so fluent in using it themselves. And again, this is a section where it might be worth you having a go with these ratio tables yourself. What's your natural instinct to answer these questions? Because it may well not be the same as what you see here. So it may be that students were inclined to have a go at the division in a different way, and that's fine in answer to the problem. But we're now working on that. Here's your way of doing it. How does it compare with the ratio table? So we're trying to make those links across different methods. So as I've said, do the problems on worksheet A5. It might be worth you having a go at those now. And in this final section now, try to make the connection between multiplication and division. So here we've got a statement again about the context we were working with. We've got a student's ratio table solution. And then we've got this formal mathematical sentence for that calculation. And I think it would be quite interesting to ask the students what they think 39 times 6 written in that way means. Do they think it means 39 lots of 6? Do they think it means 6 lots of 39? And depending on which they think, which way around it is, they can then relate it to the table in which you're actually seeing 39 lots of 6 as opposed to the other way around. And then we've got the same context. We're now thinking of it as a division problem. So there's nothing here about, oh, I do the opposite. We're not going to a procedural way of comparing these two mathematical statements. Thinking very much in terms of the context and what that means in terms of the packs and how many are in each pack. That the belief of the, these resources is the context is where pupils can make sense of their mathematics. And therefore, these, these resources don't push procedures. They don't push students to memorise things they don't understand. It's very much about using this context as a way of reasoning that enables students to make sense. So here, we can think about these 234 bottles. We're packing them in groups of six. Here we've got 234 bottles. We're packing them in groups of 39. How many packs would we have in each case? And then on page 13, you referred to the applets. Now, we found these really useful. It's the Dutch that have produced these applets. Realistic math education originated in Holland 40 years ago, and they've been producing resources of this type for that period of time. And we have collaborated with the Dutch to produce the English version, Making Sense of Math. And then there's a brief summary and a check your work, which just revisits some of the ideas and enables you to see whether those models are still around. You know, are students using that number line for subtraction? Are they thinking about the grid method there in question four and chopping up, still being aware of the relative sizes? And in the worksheet book, what we've tried to do is actually, at the end of that, put in some GCSE-style questions. But again, what we found was really helpful was that in getting students to tackle these, teachers were still pushing the models that had been used in the chapters. They don't suddenly become dropped and replaced with formal maths. The students still would be working with those models. So just to summarise some of the themes that run through, first of all, the idea that answers will vary and that it's important to share a range of strategies and to enable students to work on how one strategy compares with another. Another important feature is the use of context. 
which often were presented in the form of photograph, and then models, which are mathematical representation of those contexts, how important it is to embrace the context to enable students to talk about their experiences, and also how important it is for the teacher at times to force a return to the context when things have become quite, mathem quite mathematical the teacher should be asking questions to force a return to the context because that enables the students often to make sense of that maths. And again another important feature that runs throughout these books and I think really is the nub of about of a mathematician being functional is how do you know you're right? You know, are you just giving a procedural response to that question? which is based on memory, or actually do you have something solid to go back to that helps you know that you're right? And that's what the context helped to provide students with a way of knowing that they are correct.